Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. What do you tell someone who's basically saying, I know that I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, but it doesn't matter how I live any longer as long as I'm saved. Now, what would you tell someone like that? Now, we can begin to try to penetrate his real faith experience. Did he really trust Christ to save you or not? But the best you've done, you can see that he says or she says that she's saved and you've got all the right answers. So you're going to assume that she is or that he is. What do you do with a person like that? What does God have to say about a person like that? Now, some of you, you might have heard voices like that in your own families. Maybe someone that's your friend. Maybe someone in the church has already said that to you. And I could honestly say that there are times in my life since I've been saved, since I was 16, that I could have said the very same things myself. So I'm not pointing my finger at any of you. We've all been through this. But it was through the careful study and having good Bible teachers in my life that really taught me what is God's mind on that and how I should think. And then how should I um, believe and then how should I act based upon those truths. And so from today's study, I hope that we can go a little bit further down our road of sanctification being set apart for a purpose to bring glory and honor to the Lord. So again, if you look at Romans chapter 6, it's an easy divide chapter. I'll show you about that in a moment. But just for a brief review, let me go over a couple of words that we've been studying the last couple of weeks because we are blessed with a lot of guests here today, first-timers, and I don't want them to just come in the middle of a message and not really see it in its continuity. Here are three words for you. The first word is the word justification. The second word is the word Um, uh, sanctification. The third word is the word glorification. Justification is where you come to the Lord and you admit that you're a sinner. You place your faith alone in Jesus Christ who died and rose again. You did nothing to do to get that. It's all by his grace. At that moment, the Lord looked down upon you and he said, your faith in Christ and what Christ did on the cross, and that's all you did was put your faith in Christ. I am satisfied with that faith because I'm satisfied with the death of my son and his resurrection. Therefore, here's what I'm going to do. I am declaring you righteous. I am declaring you justified. I'm declaring you just as if you've never sinned. And I'm oversimplifying that last phrase, but basically that's it. So that's a one-time event that happened at the moment that you trusted Christ. You do not need to do that again. Now we move from that to the term sanctification. Now sanctification is something that, again, the moment you trust Christ, you then are seen by God at that very moment being sanctified, already pure, already perfect, already sinless in the eyes of God as if you're in heaven. However, God also sees you that we are still living in the nasty here and now. So now he says you have the sanctification issue where you are sanctified positionally, but yet, you're not living your sanctification practically. Again, sanctification, being set apart, made pure and holy for a purpose of glorifying God. The third word is the word glorification. Glorification is something where, again, God sees you right now, already in heaven, glorified, totally perfect, standing before him the very moment you trusted Christ. At the same time, God sees us here in the nasty here and now where we're not glorified. And no matter what we do, we'll never be glorified in this world because we don't have a glorified body nor mind or anything like that. So here's what he promises. He promises to those who are justified by faith alone that you now will be fully glorified when you get to heaven. So now look at the tenses. Past tense, we've trusted Christ as Savior. We're justified. The present tense Here on this earth, we are being sanctified moment by moment by the choices we make. When we die, we will be fully glorified in heaven. So past, present, and future. Now there are two more terms, and these two terms are important to remember as we go through this study again, and why the people often will go through Romans, particularly 6, 7, and 8 chapters, and they're all confused or they begin to front load or back load the gospel with certain amount of good deeds because they do not not understand these two very important biblical principles. One word is the word positional truth, and the second word is the word practical truth. 
I've alluded to that in this message, but we've taught heavily on it in the past message. And when I conclude the message, I'm going to do it again because I want you to fully own the idea of positional truth and practical truth. Because if you understand that, then it'll help you to understand that we're not only saved by grace, we're kept saved by grace, we're disciplined by grace, we're empowered by grace, and it's all by God's grace. Now again, positional truth is that God sees you the moment you trust Christ positionally already in heaven, already perfect. You will not go up and down. You won't lose your salvation. So think of the word position. I use the illustration of standing. I'm in a position. I'm not moving. I'm not going anywhere. I'm in one position. When I trusted Christ, I'm in one position. That will never change. It's changeless. All right? The second word starts with a P as well to make it easy to remember. It's practical truth. Practical truth is the way we live now. Positional truth is the way God sees us. Practical truth is now living the way God sees us. Positional truth, it's a done deal. Practical truth is something that goes on and on and on and on. So what we're teaching now is on sanctification. So we'll have to go back to the positional truth so you see yourself already in Christ, but you also need to see, need to see the practical truth. Position is in Christ, practical is day to day. Now with that in mind, let me go over Romans chapter 6 again, and I'll show you that it can be divided up into two parts. There's two questions and two answers to Romans chapter 6. Two questions, two answers. Let's look at question number one. Question number one is found in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, and it kind of bleeds over again into verse 2. Verse 1 says this. And by the way, let me pause before I go any further. This was written, to really make it simple, to, already, to people who already knew Christ as Savior. So again, whether you remember what day or hour you're saved on isn't important, but you know that by faith alone in Christ, you trust that Christ as your Savior. Would you slip up your hand right now? How many know they're going to heaven? Okay. Now, that means this book was written to the Romans and by extension to us today of believers in Christ. So here's what he says. What shall we say then? Are we, Jewish Christians in this context and for us today, are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? The response is found in verse 2. May it never be, or no, 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 no. We are not to continue in sin so that grace may increase. We're not to do that. I'll explain that in a moment. Go to verse 15 now because you're going to see the second question and the second answer. That's why this is divided into two parts. Verse 15 says, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And the answer is, may it never be. And that's the answer. All right, let's see if I can show you that although they sound very similar... And you might read it in Scripture. You might be saying, he's pretty redundant. He seems to be saying the same thing. Die to sin, alive to Christ, and all this stuff. It's just so complicated in there. Actually, it's not. If you pay attention to the key words and show the difference. Notice, if you will, in the first part of verse 1, it says, if we continue in sin. Those of you that are wanting to, you can mark your Bible or however you have an electronic gadget there. Underline the phrase, continue in sin. That means the first question and the first answer is dealing with the issue of a Christian who basically says, it doesn't matter how I ever live my life, I'm going to live it as I please because I place my faith in Christ and my motivation to do that is this. I get more grace since I'm saved by grace as a sinner. That means the more sin means the more grace. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sin the rest of my life. So here's the phrase. Lifestyle of sin means an overabundance of God's grace. That's what they think. Now, the answer to that is found in verse 2. What does it say? May it never be. Okay? That's the continuing sin. Now, what we're going to study today, we're going to talk a little bit different. Now, it's not so much living in sin. It's talking to a different group of Christians. This is the one that says, you know, um, I know I'm saved by grace. I've committed my life to Christ as a way to say thank you. But, you know, I'm still going to sin now and then. And when I do, hey, that's okay. I can go for forgiveness. I've got to get out of jail free pass. And I can get the grace from the Lord and all that. Uh, periodically. It's okay. So we now don't really need to work toward or work up or work forward in our sanctification. We just kind of say, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'll do the best I can here. I'm not too bad, not too good. It's all right. Because from moment, that's the phrase, moment to moment, I will have that forgiveness. Well, part of that is true. The real answer is, is that the way we ought to think? Is that the way we ought to live? What's the answer to that question? May it never be. 
So first one is, can I just go ahead and sin and the more I sin, the more grace I get as a Christian? We ought not to live like that, Christians. Doesn't mean you don't become a Christian. Doesn't mean you don't stay a Christian. It means you ought not to live like that. That's not the right thinking, not the right believing, nor the right acting. Over here, the one person says, you know what? I'm not really bad. I might blow my top once in a while. I might uh, use a curse word once in a while. I might have a dirty thought once in a while, but that's okay. I can deal with it. Well, God says, do I do that sin? The Bible says, no, may it never be. Now, some of you are saying, well, man, that means a Christian life is awfully hard. I'll never be able to live this thing. I'll never be able to make it work. Well, if you pay attention to Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8, you will see yourself, here it is, growing in that grace. You will grow in your sanctification. You will become more and more, moment by moment, like Christ. Again, like we started out with, will we ever be sinless? No. Will we sin less? Yes. So now we take this and we have two questions. We've covered that already. Now I want to spend time on the second question. The second question basically is begging this. All right? If I trusted Christ as my Savior, is it okay if I sin just once in a while? As long as I don't continue sinning all the time? Just once in a while, can I get away with that? Is that all right if I do that? I'm going to answer that. Now to do that, I need to answer it with two parts. One part is going to be we have to understand the, the issues that's involved. And so it's going to be a little bit more on the position side. What are the issues regarding the answer to that question? And then the last part and what we're going to basically begin to end with, which will be, did you catch that, begin to end with? All right. What, what we're going to do at that time is I want to give you the choices that you and I get to make because while we chose to trust Christ to save you through God's sovereignty and His Spirit and His conviction and all of that, we now have the choice what we want to do with our Christian life. And I guess if I could pause and come up for air, I want you to know that I love all of you and I, I know you love me and I'm grateful for that. The big issue is this, that we would be willing to put ourselves underneath the Word of God and make the choices to grow in grace. Now we know the power comes from the Lord, we know that He does it, but at the same time it is a matter of choice. It's like what He said, to Moses, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. And Moses then blasted that out to the children of Israel. All right. Now with that, let's go back to the passage and let's begin to unpack it. We're going to talk about what, what's the issue involved in here. So go to verse 15 and it's found from verse 15 through verse 18 as we begin to cover this. Verse 15 says, what then? Shall we sin? Maybe on occasion. Because we're not under the law but under grace, so it's okay. The Bible says, may it never be. Now verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, let's pause for a moment, that do you not know? He's not really talking in such a way that you're so ignorant. He's basically saying, don't you know this? You ought to know this. You should already have a handle on this already. Don't you know this basic truth of life? And so let me pause and ask you, when I read the rest of this verse and begin to explain it, do you know this? Do you not know this by now? And I would like to think that a church that is as healthy as ours spiritually and as committed to the Word of God. I think you know this. Now the point is, are we willing to make the choices based on what we know? Stay with me now. Remember last week we talked about, do you know it? Do you really believe it to be true? And then are you going to act upon it? Those were the three big principles from last week. Do you know it? Do you know it? And if you know it, do you really believe it to be true? You're going to count on it. Yes, I do. All right, then act like it. That's the point. All right, let's go back to the verse. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience... You are slaves of the one whom you obey. Now, when you and I read that word, slaves, and all of that, we scratch our heads because I'm not really, practically speaking, I'm not a really a slave to anyone, all right? Neither are you. We don't live in the world that the Roman people lived in, in the world of slavery. Now, we can read about it historically in America. We can read about it as it might happen in different parts of of the world. We can read about it as it's happening with children and women who are sex slaves. We can hear about some of that stuff, but it's so far away from us we really don't grab it. So let me help you understand the difference between a slave and a servant. And for us it might even be the difference between a slave, servant, and an employee. So let's just stay with the words slave and servant. All right? When you're a slave of someone, that means that person owns you. They can do anything they want to you at any time with you that you are 24-7 a slave to that owner who owns you. That means you don't have the choice once you're that slave, other than leave and get killed maybe, but you have no choice. You're under that. 
A servant, a servant has to do what the boss tells him to do, like an employee. But generally, there's a contractual relationship, whether it's a nanny or whether it's someone who does some uh, odd jobs for you around the house. They're kind of serving you as an employee. So they have an in and out clause. You work 40 hours, 20 hours, what days you're going to work, what you're going to do, what you're not supposed to do. You're hired for that event. That's a servant. So that's why wisely in here, the word slave was used and not the word servant was used. Because what happens now when you are in your unsaved situation, sin is so powerful. Satan is so diabolical. Our heart is so deceitful. So you have sin, Satan, and self all working against us that we become a true slave to sin. Now, there may be some times in our life as an unsaved person that we work real hard to overcome that little issue. But whatever it is, we are still a complete slave to that sin. It will still have a mastery over us, which we'll talk about in a moment. Let's go back to the verse. So it says here, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, your slaves are the one whom you obey? Now he gives you the two objects. Either of sin, that means you're a slave to sin, which will result in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. So the choice is you get to serve either sin or you get to serve obedience or righteousness. So you get those two going at you at the same time. So you have the choice of what you want, resulting in sin or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Let me pause for a moment. Many years ago, um, our boys, our two adopted boys, we got got them when they were older. We left San Antonio. We went to California. And on our way to California, we chose to memorize Romans chapter 6. And our son was about 10 years old who memorized this uh, and it was amazing how that I was talking to him recently. He was 42, and he was able to go back and requote this to us, how important that verse was. And then I asked him, I said, do you have any of those verses in your Bible marked? He still has his Bible. Someone gave him a leather cover that you'd put your Bible in, a leather cover that was hand-stamped with leather markings. And he said, yes, Dad, I had verse 16 because it really spoke to me. And maybe that would be a good verse for you to memorize as well. The whole chapter would be great. But if you only had one verse other than verse 23, it might be good for you to memorize verse 16 because it's kind of like the heartbeat of this whole chapter. So let me read it to you again. Do you not know that when you present yourself as someone or present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death or for obedience resulting in righteousness. Now verse 17. Paul now speaks to them and he says to these Christians, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, so he's talking to the Romans who had already trusted Christ and he's referring to something that happened before they were saved. And he says, but thanks be to God though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. You're saying, now what in the world does that mean? Very simple. Look up here, if you will. The challenge that we have when we have an English Bible in front of us, when Paul is speaking on both sides of the fence, between saved and unsaved, between positional truth and practical truth, is in the Greek there are a lot of tenses that are not found in the English. So if you follow along in the Greek, ah, it's like opening up a rose and you smell it so pretty. Now when you look in the English, it's like looking at a rose bud. It's not as full open. It's pretty aromatic, but not as much as when the rose opens. And what's in the English is really not contradicting what's in the Greek. All that's happening, though, is that it makes it a little more difficult at times to understand the tenses in the English because there are so many different words that are used with endings and prefixes that help you understand what that word means. Now, I'm not trying to wow you with that. I'm trying to let you know that as I explain this to you, you would understand it a little bit better as it comes in the Greek. Go back to verse 17 again. So he says, you were sinners, or you were slaves to sin, but you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching. That phrase, you became obedient from the heart, is something that was done in the past and it was a done deal. In other words, you then obeyed. There was a moment in your past that was a once and a one-time deal that you obeyed from the heart. That means it was a genuine, complete, fully understanding opportunity for you to place your faith, obedience of the heart, to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Now look up here. The teaching they received was that salvation was by faith alone and Christ alone. 
these unsaved Romans then, they obeyed that truth that going to heaven was by faith in Christ. So they then placed their faith in Christ. They were obedient to that doctrine, to that teaching. They were committed to that teaching. They put all their trust in Christ, believing that teaching was true. So they heard it, so they knew it. They believed it to be true. Then they acted upon it by placing their faith in it from their heart. That happened the moment they trusted Christ. But as you go a little bit further in the context, they continually stayed committed to that teaching that the word of God is true, that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that salvation was, here it is, by faith alone. They never changed from their belief of that. What now Paul is doing is to let them know, based on that fact that they were saved, now they need to leave, live a new life in Christ because Christ saved them and gave them a new life. All right, now back to the passage. All right, so again, this is positional truth in timing. Now verse 18. And having been freed from sin, that doesn't mean you don't have sin any around, around you any longer, but you're freed from the master of sin. You're freed from the influence of sin, that it doesn't have to have that influence over you. Having been, that happened the moment you trusted Christ. Now at the same time, you're still a slave. You were slaves of sin. It didn't say you stopped being slaves. It just says you were slaves of sin. When you trusted Christ, it flipped. Now you became a slave of righteousness. You became a slave of righteousness. All right. I'm trying to give you an earthly illustration. And this is, a, this is a weak one, but maybe for some of you this might help you a little bit more. Let me go back to our son, Joe. Bo both of our boys, but particularly Joe. I'll focus on him. Joe uh, and his half-brother had a mother who was a, a very loose lady and um, different fathers. So she, fa she uh, uh, mothered two two. two two boys. They were in uh, the Florida State um, home, all right? It's like an orphanage, but they don't call them that any longer. And, and by the way, I have permission to share this. With our, our, we're not going around what our son says. And uh, he would say this as well. And what happened was the state then took uh, control, took authority of the boys for their protection, for their provision, for all that they needed to be nurtured the best they could in a home. Now, when I talk about a home, we're not talking about like a home with one parent. This was a group home with kids everywhere, boys on one side, big hallway, dining hall, and the guys on the other side, room parents everywhere. That was their group home. So now we came into the picture and we adopted the two boys. We adopted Joe, using him as an illustration. When we signed the paper, we have pictures of it. We refer to that as their happy day. They came into our life on our happy day. They have a happy day. Now, when Joe came to live with us, Joe then, very soon afterwards, said, You know, Dad, you're my dad, but I don't know what to call my dad. And Mom, you're my mom, but I don't know what to call my mom. Can you understand the conflict that was going on? So we just put our arm around them. They were young, put them on our lap, and we said, How about if you do this? You call the mother who brought you into the world your birth mom. And how about if you call Carol... Mom, because a mother is someone who will take care of you and nurture you and do all things necessary so you can grow up to become a wonderful citizen and hopefully a godly Christian. How about if you do that? No problem with that. So the state legally removed the boys from the home, their own oversee, and brought them into our home, and we were stamped now the parents of the boys. Now, why am I telling you this? All right. It's as if our boys would trust Christ coming out of one environment and they came into our environment. That's the adoption concept, all right? A little different than biblical adoption, but similar. They're brought into our home. Now, once they're in our home, they never stop being a boy. They never stop being a guy and all the stuff that goes with a guy when they went from here to here. That's like you and me. Whether you're saved or not, we're slaves, okay? We're a slave to sin or we could be a slave to God, all right? So they're boys. Now, what changed, though, is that they're no longer under the authority, watch this, of the state. Now they become under the authority of Stan and Carol. Now don't go too far with this illustration. I told you it's a little weak because the state will watch us. All of you are being watched by the state and how you abuse or not abuse your children. But getting back to who owns the kids under the rights. So now they're under us. Now even though they're under us, they have more freedom to operate because now we are there, we care for them, we're providing for them, we're watching them. But let's say Joe says, you know what, I want to go back into the orphanage. And so mentally he puts himself back underneath the orphanage's rules 
of where he would eat, what he would eat, what he would do, what he could do, what he can't do, and all of that, he puts himself back under that. Now let's bring us into this. All right, it's as if we were in a state of being lost. We're still slaves. We are who we are. We're going to be totally giving ourselves over to whatever mores that are out there. We now become a Christian. We come in this new realm, and now we are what we'll call slaves of righteousness. Now, that's positionally, we're slaves of righteousness. That's who we should be. The boys are sons of Stan and Carol. Positionally, they are that. But now we have the choice whether or not we want to mentally live like the world again. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.